Hello and welcome to No Summary, Golden Thread's live stream series of conversations with artists who don't fit in a box. A note on Golden Thread and land acknowledgement. For those who may not know, Golden Thread is the first theater company in the U.S. devoted to plays from and about the Middle East. Golden Thread was founded in 1996 by playwright and director Turanj Yegyazarya. And they are based in the Ramatish Ohlone land, known colonially today as San Francisco. I'm going to introduce myself. Um, I am the um, I am a trauma informed therapist, psychotherapist, and theater artist. Um, and my relationship with Golden Thread is, I think, um, just I would love to always watch plays there uh, since it represents some of the stories that. I am familiar with and that mirror me as a person coming from the Middle East. Um, I'm going to also introduce my guests. Uh, today, I'm delighted to welcome an exciting conversation with Drowning in Cairo's Intimacy Coordinator, Maya Herbsman, and Fight Director, Carla Pantoja. Hello, everyone. So I'm going to just provide some um, context about the conversation. I, um, I watched Drowning in Cairo, and it's amazing, by the way, and would highly recommend it. Uh, when I watched it, it caught my eyes. There were some moments of strong physical um, altercation and uh, some moments of physical intimacy. And I wondered how the crew, the crew actors and director, um, went about it. Uh, in terms of safety and in terms of consent, consent. And I'm a theater artist myself, and as an actress, I also, um, you know, I also been through. Not also, I've been through uh, a couple incidents on uh, in the rehearsal room and on stage that were were, were felt like a little bit um, somehow violent or like like some touch that wasn't consented. So I just want to highlight the importance of uh, respecting the boundaries and how mushy the boundaries are in the rehearsal, uh, rehearsal room and um, in the performance space uh, regarding, regarding like, you know, when we're acting, it's, it's a little bit mushy, what is real and what is not and what is my body and what is, uh, which one is, you know, the roles, um, body and, and how all of that play together. Um, Maya and Carla will discuss their creative process and their role in safely driving the story forward. They'll share insights about the protocols that need to be used in such instances, and we'll have a broader conversation with them. And if anyone uh, from the audience also would like to ask questions directly to the panelists, I highly encourage that. Um, you can do so by utilizing the chat function or just raise the hand function. And I will, um, I will bring it back to you. So now coming back to Carla and Maya. Hello. And would you like to put your mic mics um, on? And yeah, Carla, do you want to start? Go ahead. All right. Um, so tell us more, Maya and uh, Carla. But Maya, you're you're volunteering to speak first. Maya, about your experience as um, the the uh, intimacy coordinator, and anything you would like to share too. Yeah. Um, so hi, I'm Maya. I use she her pronouns, and I live on um, Ramaytush Shaloni land, colonially known as San Francisco. Um, and so when we talk about what the process of intimacy looks like uh, on a stage play, and I could speak specifically to what we did in this process, mm -hmm. the place I always like to start is with the story. For me, there's no better, more important place to start than making sure that I understand the story mm -hmm. that's being created in the room and that the rest of the creative team, the actors, Sahar, everyone else in the room, that we are all on the same page about 
what the story is we're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's what's on the page, but knowing that every rehearsal room ends up finding their own nuances, their own layers. To me, I get really excited about diving into the kind of nitty gritty of that story because I get really excited about using intimacy as a place for nuanced physical storytelling. Um, so in this particular process, we started off just sitting on the floor, um, chatting through the relationship between the characters. I asked questions, they asked questions, um, and we all just sort of talked through the overall arcs that we see and saw um, between the characters. And so from there, once we're clear about the story that we're trying to tell, then that's where I move into consent. Um, mm -hmm. And so before any choreography happens, it's always really important to me to make sure that actors are discussing consent and discussing their boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, I think to your point, the, the boundaries could be f fluffy. And I think actors aren't generally taught to have boundaries or even that it's okay to have boundaries. Um, and, and that's so what makes it more mushy is that we're taught not to have boundaries, to just give our bodies to theater and to what is needed. Exactly, to just say yes, um, right? Or if you don't, there's 50 people right out back who will say yes if you don't. Um, so I see a lot of my job, of course there's the creative elements, but I see a lot of the work as being about being an advocate, and and being someone who can empower actors to find their own boundaries and to recognize that it's okay to have them and good to have them. Um, so we start by talking about that, about boundaries, about consent. And oftentimes actors don't always know immediately what, what right. their, their boundaries want to be, right? Because most of the time they haven't been asked. Um, and so often, I think about my work is creating a safe enough room that if a boundary is crossed because we didn't know it was there, hmm. that we'll all be okay and we'll be able to handle that and it won't be a big crisis. Mm. Um, so it's so holding one, space for the process too of if a boundary gets um, crossed or, or violated, how you show up for it. Exactly. And setting up structures also so that when I'm not in the room, hmm again, a crisis won't occur, everyone will be able to resolve it quickly and easily. Um, and, and just for the actor to know that there's someone for me to go to, even if the actor did it and went home to sleep and then in bed, I was like, oh, then this wasn't good. This didn't feel good. Right. Oh, but well, I have um, someone supporting me where I can go to. So there's a safe space for me. This availability that you, you offer as the intimacy coordinator, um, Absolutely. To... Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's important. And, um, and so once we've talked about consent, the beauty of that, right, is then one doesn't need to ask for consent every single time, right? Because we've set mm -hmm. up, this is what's on the table, this is what's okay. So instead of having to every time in the midst of walking, can I touch your shoulder? Can I move it slightly down? Can I adjust the angle of my hand, right? Then we can just sort of save the time and the actors don't need to be concerned that they're crossing the other person's boundaries. Right. Um, and so from there, we start to get into choreography. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of the work that really excites me artistically. Yeah, I want to um, I want to ask more about choreography, but I want to go first to Carla um, so that we're having a gist about uh, intimacy and how you navigate intimacy, as well as a gist about how we navigate fights. And then we're going to expand further to um, artistic means. Thank you, Maya. Um, Carla, Ooh. welcome. Hi, y'all. Um, I am zooming in from the land of the Shasta and Tekelma people, which is colonially known as Ashland, Oregon. I am um, normally from the Bay Area, and but right now I'm at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival as a fight director. Whee! Um, I I started training in stage combat uh, um, over 20 years ago, and I have been, my connection with Golden Thread is auditioning, but also being a fight director on, mm -hmm. on many, many productions with Golden Thread, and I'm so appreciative and grateful 
to be able to practice and hone my craft as a fight director at places like Golden Thread that have given me opportunities to, to work with so many different um, directors and new playwrights, it's really exciting. <laughs> and, and helping to support stories um, that, that aren't, that are not shared mainstream, whatever that is, um, which is really important to me. Um, and, and how did you find your way to, to theater in general from the combat, combat world to? Um, it was one of the trainings. I started training, this is sounding so hoof, but um, <laughs> I started training at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. And I took a, a summer Shakespeare workshop, which was affectionately or not affectionately termed the American program. Um, <laughs> so I took that and with, with that programming came stage combat, uh, which mm. I loved. Mm. Oh my gosh. I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. And I continued to train when I came back to the States thinking that I would never use this in my life as a female actor, mm -hmm. um, that I'd never get a chance to wield a sword or do any of that. And um, I've built a career out of so, that. So this was part of your training program as an actor. And then That's, you kind of branched out from here. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of specialized and continued my training and, and focus. And I'm still training to this day. Mm -hmm. Everything is like an opportunity, num, num, num. Take, take it all in. Um, and working with this, this particular show, um, what I tend to do is when I, when I come into the room, I start off with a basic stage combat workshop of mm. tools that I think we may need after just like Maya, I read the script. I talk to the director, see what is the story we're, we're trying to tell here? What are the images that you're looking for? What do you, what is the, the string that you want to pull in the audience as they're there? How do you want them to react to this story or this fight? Um, and so that is all the background work. We come together, we do a, a kind of a mini workshop because not everybody has the opportunity to train in stage combat. In, a, in other words, it's, it's, it's one of those things that I obviously feel every actor should have because it's a way to keep yourself and your partner safe. Mm. We talk about um, that in stage combat, the person that you're fighting with in a scene is not your opponent. They're your partner. You're there to tell a story. It just happens to be a physical one. And so mm. we, we build with some of the, some tools that I think everybody could use. And, and it also gets me a, a feel for how folks move with unarmed work that we did in this one um, unarmed being hand-to-hand -hand combat, which <laughs> is a weird way to name it, unarmed. It doesn't, there's no weapons involved um, other than words. Um, I tend to give folks some general ideas and then I wanna talk to the actors about how they're feeling. I do ask about, you know, does, are there any concerns? I, uh, things that are important for fight directors to, to understand and, and something that, that helped solidify for me was working with, with Maya before and working with some uh, and training in intimacy direction is asking folks about and holding that space for folks to have those moments of like, mm, I don't think I wanna do that particular move. Okay, we don't need to. Mm. I don't need to force an actor to do something because it looks cool or whatever. Um, that's, just like that's, Maya. Just, that's a safety measure that unfortunately is not taken into consideration in a lot of the productions that happen worldwide and, and here in the US. So here you're raising a very important point. There's a consent that the actor needs to give and it's not about just forcing like, well, this is how, what the role says and this is what we need to do. 
we can, if someone is creative, they can go around those things and make the same story pop. Um, the longer that I've worked as a fight director, the more I, I encounter folks who have had personal connection with violence. Mm. And so it's about being mindful of making right. sure that folks, the actors come in safe and they mm. leave out. They, they, they come in clean, leave clean. In other mm. words, they're safe mentally, physically. They're there to do a job and, and beautifully and to do, be able to do it without fear. Mm. If somebody brings fear to the stage, you can't bring your whole self to the stage. Right. You're always worried about that slap or that thing that, oh, that scene, I don't know about it. Um, right. You can't get past that. Yeah. And I love how you say it's about also creativity and being mindful. Um, a lot of the times when we have the space and awareness to be mindful around people's bodies and needs, this is when creativity comes out. When there's no space, when we're just stuck into the role or by the book. Um, and here I want to also emphasize the importance of safety in rehearsal spaces, because a lot of the time, even theater uh, teachers at school, they promote a culture of well, yeah, I'm training you. This is your body. I can touch it. I can push you without even um, telling you ahead of time what I'm going to do. You know, like a lot of the times there's an uh, element of surprise for students in some schools that are not um, promoting awareness and are not sensitive to um, safety measures and um, awareness around this topic. So thank you both for bringing um, this and I, I also like I'm, I'm thinking also about um, violence in general, uh, in terms of, you know, sexual harassment or violence um, in, in different settings. And this is a setting, a specific setting that we're talking about, but it intertwines with all the, um, uh, all the ways that we show up in, in all the other settings regardless if it's home or work or theater or um, movies. And we saw um, the recent um, shooting, unfortunately, that happened in, um, I forgot the name of the actor, please help me, Alec, Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin, um, and around the, safe, the importance of safe, safety measures in, in uh, such a setting. Um, I would love to expand further on uh, choreography and artistic aspects and how they um, move together with, with this um, topic, intimacy and, and fight and directing these two um, areas. Whoever would like to start first. Maya, you mentioned choreography. Oh, sorry, Carla. Go I'll, I'll go, I'll go, and then I'll pass it to Maya. Because um, I was um, just, just like Maya talking to the actors about what, um, you know, we've got, we've got our, our, our bag of tricks, our tools, right, that we've trained in at a basic workshop of what I think they may be able to use. It's not all the tools that, but the, these are things that, that will get, um, actors feeling more comfortable with, ah, oh, mm. I remember doing this in, in theater class or whatever, mm. then, then we build it. I build it with the actors. With unarmed work, I, I tend to work with the actress to, to say, okay, I think this is where we talk about the story mm. and, and kind of probably similar to how Maya works is we talk about the story, what the arc is. And then I, I talk about impulses from the actors. Mm. What, what feels right um, and, and working with Saha to, to make the journey look right with mm. the script, the actors, the staging. Ah, this is where so-and-so is coming from, from over here and they're coming over here. What does that look like? What does years of pent up rage mm. look like against someone who has been oppressed Mm -hmm. by a bully mm -hmm. for the bulk of their youth and, and young adult life. What does that look like? Mm 
Mm. And so, uh, so talking you... with the actors about what that looks like and, and, and build it from there. Mm. So here you're, you're included in um, psychological aspects and analysis of the role's um, journey around rage as well as the actor's uh, experience around rage. So Carla, in a kind of in a setting where you and like, what do we see? Let's say like I had a peak. I went to on a day where Carla was working on this topic with Sahar. What do we see? We see Sahar and Carla sitting, um, uh, in, uh, and moving, then the actors on stage and moving you're, around. Yeah, in, uh, you're discussing in with the oh. actors, uh, looking at okay, well, what about this? And, and sharing ideas and actors bring their own ideas of like, oh, I feel like I want to do this. Okay, mm -hmm. an actor brings an impulse and I am able to, uh, because of my training, help them do it safely. So I look mm -hmm. at distance, what's a safe distance for like, there's a hammer fist that's thrown. Mm -hmm. What is a safe distance for that? To, mm -hmm. to go through and look powerful. So I give the technique. We walk through the technique super duper slow mm. um, just to make sure um, demonstrating, have the actors try it. Then we uh, build like what makes sense from here? What happens next? What happens next? What is the body, the way the body is moved this way it means it makes sense for the body to unfurl back this way. Mm. And so we, we build it from there. Mm. I look at it maybe in slow motion. Maybe it gets a little faster. Maybe mm. fast is not important. The speed will come. It's more about intention. Right. And uh, they're looking technically. So actors now are carrying the technical of like, okay, I need to be this far away and I've got to do this through here and it's got to cross the plane of my partner's face. They're meanwhile doing a nap, which is K-N-A-P and it's a sound like a clap or a hit on a body. We use those in, in live theater to pretend that there's been a hit of, of contact and so they're, the actors are thinking along the technical, but they're also bringing their emotional intention, their acting intention mm. behind it. So they're thinking on multiple levels um, as they, they do the fight. Right. Uh, so here so, you're talking about um, examining impulses, distance, uh, slowliness, because of, you know, we want to bring mindfulness and intentionality, um, safety. All of these are elements that, that are crucial to this, uh, to this exchange between you and, and the director and the actors. Yep. Thank you, Carla. Um, Maya, tell us about how, how intimacy, um, and I'm wondering actually, intimacy coordinator and fight director, why is it not like intimacy director? Why is it intimacy coordinator? Uh, intimacy director is typically used in theater and intimacy coordinator is typically used in film, but um, mm -hmm. people kind of use them interchangeably sometimes and that is a-okay. <laughs> so I'm allowed to say, how do you direct intimacy? Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> so how do you direct intimacy in choreography? Yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways, my process at least begins very similarly to Carla's. And then I think we... Um, we at some point kind of diverge uh, because as you would imagine, going in slow motion is not exactly something that would work well for a, a kiss <laughs> or something, right? right. Um, it would actually probably make it like significantly more uncomfortable than it needed to be. So right. at some point we definitely kind of split off, um, but I think we, we start similarly um, yeah. and we start, um, we start with, oh, sorry, this dog's going to start barking. Um, we start uh, with, just as Carla said, looking at the sort of psychological elements of the choreography uh, or of the moment rather. So in the same way that Carla talks about this sort of the years of pent up rage, I'm looking at what does this kiss mean for these two characters? Mm. 
Um, yeah. And with this show in particular, um, with, you know, thinking about the, the environment, the world that Khaled and Moody are living in and the significance of a kiss and how different that would be from maybe say, you know, two gay men in San Francisco on Castro Street, right? That, that we're looking at the psychological aspects of the character, but also- Context. The, yeah, the context, exactly. The broader cultural context. Cultural context, historical context, yeah. Exactly, that the intimacy is, is happening within. Mm. Um, so you also the, get into psychological okay. aspects and, and, and different contexts like Carla, who we were talking. Yeah, definitely. Is this yeah. their first kiss? Um, mm -hmm. Is one of them, has they been thinking about this for a while? Is one of them more excited than the other, right? I like to kind of get into the nuances mm -hmm. of the story we're trying to tell so that we can be specific. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so again, starting with story, right? And so then once we do that, then we start to figure out the practicalities. Um, and I, I could not agree more with what Carla said that I think there's always another way to tell a story. Mm -hmm. um really early in my intimacy work i was um working with two actors who had a number of of kisses of lip flip contact and one of the actors got mono um and having to then change all of that choreography of course right to prevent actors from sharing the the illness mm totally cracked it open for me. Um, mm. And I and I then understood that even when it just, it seems like there has to be a kiss there, there has to be, it has to be, it has to be, it has to be. That was the moment for me where I learned that it actually doesn't have to be anything. And that there's always, there's always going to be another way to tell the story well, whether it's because of mono or because of an actor's boundary or anything else. Um, and so, as much as we want to be respectful and mindful to stage directions, I also always sort of take the time to get a sense of, do these stage directions actually align with the actor's consent and their boundaries? Um, right. And do the stage directions align with the story that's being told in this particular room? Mm -hmm. um, so once we have a sense of that, then we start to build the choreography. I, I like to build choreography really collaboratively um, in the way that maybe a dance choreographer might sort of prepare all the steps um, and come in with something totally choreographed to then teach to the actors. Mm. I would never approach it that way for reasons that might be obvious, right? That it's, it to me, it feels antithetical to consent um, to come in and tell actors that they should do an a moment of intimacy a certain way without taking their impulses and boundaries and needs into account big time um, so it's actor centered it's not imposed on absolutely. actors absolutely it's very actor centric um and of course always working in collaboration with the director mm. um sometimes carla and i might work in collaboration or i might work with um a dance choreographer in collaboration um but so we build the choreography together um and then from there um I'll, I'll, the way I like to work is we'll build a shape, we'll try mm -hmm. it, and then we'll see what's missing or what didn't work, or are we getting the story? Okay, that I didn't feel like I had enough time as an audience member to process what was happening. So maybe we need to lengthen that. I like to approach choreography really technically, much like Carla does, um, mm -hmm. right? How long does a certain moment last? where are your hands going, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And not just that there's not room for improvisation, there is. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to start from a really technical place mm -hmm. um, for a range of reasons, but I think the main one being that it keeps it consistent. It can make it make sure it's repeatable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that can take, to Carla's point, that can take some of the weight off, right? That you're not then having to worry about how that slap's gonna go or that kiss is gonna go because you have the structure in place. Right. Um, yeah, so that's how I approach choreography. And then I guess the yeah. last step of that is, you know, we sort of, we finish it out in the rehearsal room and then I come back um, mm -hmm. usually during tech week or, or maybe, you know, before or after depending on the circumstances. But I like to see it in the greater context 
of a run because maybe what felt really good in my isolated rehearsal room actually doesn't totally vibe once we're on the set in Potrero stage um, or maybe the design has moved in a way that we could better be supporting um, or, or whatever it is. Um, but I always like to come back before the show gets in front of an audience to make sure that the choreography is still feeling like it fits within the greater arc of the story. Mm. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, and here you can uh, uh, read Sahara saying another aspect that might be interesting to highlight is how we maintain safety after creating the choreography and after performances start running. Yeah, um, I can start on that. For mm -hmm. intimacy, the way that we approach that, um, there's a couple sort of protocol options depending on, on the scope of the intimacy in the play. Mm -hmm. um, while I'm working with the actors on building the choreography and the director, the stage manager is a really crucial part of that equation because what the stage manager is doing is they're taking notes um, mm. and they're writing down for us exactly what the choreography is supposed to be every night. Um, and because when I leave, when the show opens, I'm not there, Carla's not there, Sahara's not there. Well, I guess Sahara's around sometimes, <laughs> um, but maybe not every night. Um, but the person who is consistently always going to be there is the stage manager. Stage manager. And so for me, that's the person who's responsible for safety. Mm. Um, and because, most of the time, a stage manager is watching the show, right? They're calling the cues, but they're watching. Right. Um, and so then what I like to encourage stage managers to do is just touch base with the actors um, after performances, if they notice something. Mm. Hey, I noticed the hand went a little farther up than it usually goes, right? Um, right. right. I imagine Carla's gonna talk in a second about what fight calls are. Um, and mm. intimacy calls are something that can happen um, for this show in particular, they weren't totally necessary. Um, an intimacy call would be, say if there was maybe um, an extended scene of simulated sex, that might be something really great to, to practice every day to make sure you're getting it. For something like a kiss, it tends to not be necessary to practice that. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do encourage actors to do and ask actors to do is to just touch base with each other every single day when they come in. They come in, they're in the dressing room, they're getting changed. Just take a quick moment to say, hey, everything go okay last night? Is consent still the same today? All right. And um, so then they have to touch base every day and make sure that they're still in the same place. If they wanna talk about anything from the previous performance, they can do that. Um, and so we've got these sort of layers of systems built in so that there's plenty mm. of opportunities for people to bring up issues. So right. that no one's sort of festering, um, whether that comes from the actors themselves or from the stage manager, there are these systems in place to sort of catch issues as they come up. And then of course, I'm always available yeah. after the show ends. I very rarely need to go back once the show's open, but whether it's for an understudy or someone gets sick or there's some other reason to change the choreography, something's not reading, something's not working. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like disappear into a cloud of smoke. <laughs> I'm, I'm always available um, for team members to reach out. Mm. Maya, I can't tell you how as a psychotherapist, I'm so happy and satisfied to hear about this. <laughs> there are systems that are mm -hmm. built to support uh, the actors, because we all know that psychologically speaking, people can get triggered way after um, the incident itself. It can be sometimes years, it can be hours. Um, and so that's what you're bringing here is very crucial to maintain safety and hold space continuously um, in the process of creating a play. Yeah. Um, and I should say that I'm also trained in trauma-informed care. I'm sure not to the extent that you are, but that mm -hmm. has been a really sort of crucial part of my training mm -hmm. was in mental health, first aid and trauma-informed care um, and various trauma studies because yeah, absolutely. They're so connected. Mm, well, that's, it's so important too, to be um, having this background. I'm, I'm glad you shared. Um, so uh, um, I want to do a reminder here for anyone who's joining us is that if you are joining us now, this is No Summary Golden Threads live stream series of conversations with artists who do not fit in a box. 
we're in a conversation with Maya Herbsman and Carla Pantoja about the safety um, and protection and creativity of intimacy and fight as they come up in storytelling and in theater. So um, I want to let me see there's a lot of questions coming up, but I want to also encourage the audience if you have any question, please um use the feature uh raise hand feature or write it in the chat um and ask it directly to panelists we're more than happy to hear from you so um yeah the, as i mentioned there's different like questions coming up let me see what i have here um i want to ask is there is it something that like um you know, you talked to Carla about being trained in it. If someone is watching and got so excited, like, oh my God, I want to do this. <laughs> where, where do they go? How do they, um, like, what, how do they train? Are there schools? And in that process also, I want to ask if, you know, these protocols are, um, is there like any ethical codes, any, um, order syndicate whatever <laughs> containing this uh these topics these professions i i can speak about that um going back to the uh, other question about how once i'm gone what what happens um there's a fight captain for a show and in this particular show, because everybody's in the fight, it's our stage manager, because as Maya was saying, stage manager is always there, always watching um, the holder of so many things and the blocking. And so fight, uh, fight call happens before every show. And it is all the moments of violence in slow motion. Mm -hmm. it, there's, there's also a level that, that kind of just merges with with Maya um, Maya's work in that actors uh, talk with each other. How how's it going? How is you, how are you feeling? Um, if for example, if if an actor is like, wow, you know, I'm I'm feeling a little out of it, so maybe we do this fight a little slower today. Mm. Okay, if that's what makes it safer and more comfortable, then do it. Please, mm. you know. There's, there's so you so honor many, moment to moment. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And it's day to day. Something that I have incorporated with, with my work um, from learning about intimacy direction, which work, I got to work with Maya for the first time through Golden Thread mm -hmm. a, a few years ago. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's somebody who supports. I was like, I, I've always felt that fights and, and intimacy, you know, there's, there's a lot of crossover and a lot of safety right. and holding and, and boundaries and, and care. Right. And I was so excited and not, not all fight directors do this. I do this, but I, I, I've added in tapping in and tapping out with actors and it's, it's mainly a, an intimacy direction thing, but being able to have eye contact breath in just a moment mm. and then a high 10 um, to say okay I am I'm clocking in now I'm working this is this is we're working on this and it's it's a way to physically and mentally like step into the space of here I am this is what we're doing I'm here working as an actor on this character and then tapping mm. out and the actors can choose to, to use it or not, but it's an offering. Mm. Um, so with, with fight call, they can do a tap in at the beginning of uh, the fight call, checking in, how, how are things going? Like, you know, maybe somebody's shoulder is acting up. So that hit will be a little slower. Okay. They're, they're gonna do the fight very, very slow. The stage manager is gonna watch it Usually I give certain like notes of, ooh, watch this slap from this, this point in the um, audience and over here just to see, make sure that it reads that it's across the face and that it's not like, you know, <laughs> happening up here or something. Um, and then 
then they do it with intention and and that's that's it so they've touched on those moments so before he, so here carla you're um describing uh what's a fight call is like maya uh suggested yeah. yeah thank you and i see uh, before we go to where do people train um I see a question here from Sheila. I would love to hear about process and technique of cooling down after the performance. How do actors let go of big emotions? Yeah, I can start there. I think that that's, I think that's one of the hardest parts of this. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, sort of coming back to the sort of the trauma element, I think that one of the biggest things I've learned about trauma is that just because our brain knows that something's not real, it doesn't necessarily mean that our body does. Um, and so I think that sometimes right. actors' bodies can feel as activated as if the thing is actually happening to them, even yeah. as much as we fully know it's not. Yeah. And here we come back to trauma, um, how, how the body carries the trauma. And it's exactly. not necessarily, sometimes people don't remember what trauma happened, but their body remembers. Exactly. And so, so we're not just talking about sort of like, you know, releasing after a performance, we're also talking about this very real process mm -hmm. of sort of calming the body down. Um, and so what I, you know, every actor is different. There's no perfect methodology to this. Mm -hmm. um, but what I see as my job is just to give actors tools um, and hopefully some work. And if they don't, then great, mm. come back to me and I'll see what else I can come up with and I'll ask colleagues and, and see what else we can figure out. Um, but the sort of starting, the place that I usually start is I encourage actors to build rituals for themselves, both with a scene partner and alone. Mm. Um, so I'll use myself as an example. I, early in my intimacy career, was finding that I was sort of bringing it home with me, um, mm. which is, I think, a lot of what Sheila's talking about here um, with letting go of big emotions. I was bringing home the actor's emotions that I was working with, the play. It was all coming back in my car with me. Um, and yeah. I, I realized pretty quickly that that was becoming a really big inhibitor. Um, mm being able to do the work and so what i've built for myself is little rituals that i use to kind of bring myself into the space and bring myself out um i wear rings and so for me it's really helpful to have something physical so when mm. i put on the ring i am an intimacy director i'm there i'm focused mm. and when i take it off it's just me here, uh, Maya, you're talking about the provider's uh, way to take care of themselves when they're providing for others. Um, mm. Because this can lead to compassion fatigue for a lot of providers yeah. when they don't um, bring awareness to how they're carrying the people's energies. And Absolutely. And so, and I think that that can apply to actors too, right? And so, you know, mm -hmm. I have, I, I use the rings, that's a physical thing. Um, I use music. Um, I always like to sort of like sing and dance in my car on the way home to kind of get some of the energy out. I have colleagues that run. That's mm, not for me. Um, <laughs> we all have, yeah, incense, sage, whatever, right? We all have our different strategies. And so what I try and talk to actors about is about finding that strategy that works for them um, so that when they come home at the end of a performance, they're not just you know, letting themselves sort of come off of the adrenaline and then just kind of go home and mm. lie in bed, right? That they're actually being thoughtful around taking the time to whatever it is. I, I invite actors for actors who physical things are helpful. Maybe there's something on your costume that can work, or yeah. maybe you can, you know, sneak a little something somewhere that, the co <laughs> that we won't see on the costumes, right? For some people, it's about scent. Um, yeah. For some people, having like an essential oil fragrance to smell after can sort of help break them out. Yeah, um, and and here you're talking about actors, but I want to invite the audience to also incorporate that <laughs> in their daily oh, life yeah. because um, here we're talking specifically because the setting happens to be about theater. But um, you know, in terms of self care, oh, yeah. we really need to 
kind of set boundaries. And these boundaries can be set physically through a ritual or through incense, uh, through anything that represents our boundary. Like, okay, my intention of setting boundary is to wash my hands, for example, between um, one show and another, or like one client and, and another. Or um, I remember between clients sometimes when I used to work in uh, the uh, office, there's a sand tray. And then I would just put my hands on the sand and it just feels so grounding and brings me back to myself. And then I can uh, kind of cleanse and reset. So here we're talking about like cleansing and resetting and coming back to our ourselves in a way that's uh, respecting ourselves and just showing attention. So it's just about helping with tools um, and and inviting actors to sort of take even just a minute, two minutes, you know, it doesn't have to be a whole long drawn out thing, but right. just invite them to take the moment to be mindful of how they come down. Um, and I found that generally what I hear anyway, is that that tends to help actors mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that, that thinking about just giving themselves some sort of closure yeah. for the night. Um, can make a really big difference. And I also invite actors to do that with each other, mm -hmm. speaking to Carla, sort of tapping in and tapping out. Um, you know, they build, they have these really intense relationships on stage. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we talk about cooling down, for me, I think we're not only talking about the actor within themselves, but we're also talking about the relationships, mm -hmm. um, right? And in this particular instance, uh, the three actors spending an enormous amount of time together. Um, and, and so I wanted to make sure that I was able to give them some tools so that they could just take a moment at the end of the day to sort of <sighs> disconnect. Okay. We did this. Hmm. We were just moody and Khaled and now we are just ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, De-rolling. That's like in. Yeah. De-rolling. So exactly. Yeah like getting the role out. And here, exactly. is, are you also uh, talking about what Sahar has uh, said in the chat, um, setting up a ritual with and for the actors, they both taught actors kind of rit ritualistic check-ins, love that, and it's been working for us, Cairo team. <laughs> so uh, these are the check-ins that are afterwards or there's also check-ins before? Um, usually on both sides. So the sort of like basic okay. tap in that, that okay. I think probably Carla and I both use, um, yeah. or at least I, I won't speak for Carla, is um, that, okay, cool. Um, that I'll give, um, if Carla and I are tapping in, when we come in at the start of the day, maybe we'll check in. Um, we'll maybe face each other, take a nice deep breath together. <sighs> we'll make eye contact and give us a little high five, high 10. Mm -hmm. And that means, okay, we're starting our work session. Um, and then at the end of the day, after a show, after a rehearsal, um, when we're sort of clocking out, so to speak, for the night, then we'll all have, just have them do the same thing. Hmm. Again, deep breath, and another high five. And so yeah. actors often will modify and make their own versions that fit better to them. That's just the sort of template I give them. Hmm. Um, but exactly bookmarking it so that you sort of, the body has a way to recognize, okay, we're stepping into one thing, and now we're stepping Leaving out. the other. Yeah, great. Maya, thank you so much. Carla, I want to ask you about um, how to maintain, I'm not sure if, you know, during your experience working on improvisation, how do you maintain safety and protection while actors are improvising and not rehearsing a script? I'm asking this because what comes up for me now is, um, or I thought about it before, uh, presenting this, I was like, oh, I want to ask this question because what happened to me as an actress one time is we were improvising and the improvisation was about like, okay, now you have to kind of um, as uh, roles in the roles, pick on each other. And it kind of turned out into a kind of like a physical violence. And I, I couldn't stop it because I was um, interpreted that I was saying stop in the role and they didn't know that it's me saying stop. So that was like really hard. Uh, I was triggered. I was like uh, feeling very unsafe and I wanted this to stop. 
and just it couldn't until you know um, damage has uh, happened and then afterwards I talked about it and um, it was really really um, damaging so how do you maintain a container during improvisation first of all I am so sorry that that happened to you yeah thank you thank you I I have to say as a fight director as I, I was talking about the longer I've gone as a fight director the more I encounter folks who have had uh, physical uh, personal physical connection with violence or personal connection with violence. And, and that is the story. And I hear folks come to me and they, they tell me yeah. some of their, hor their, their theatrical horror stories. And I'm, sh I know that folks tell Maya their <laughs> theatrical. There are horror, horror stories, stories out and, there. And yes, Mine is just one. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And um, I, it makes me sad it makes me angry that mm. there's um, a lot of um, misunderstanding around what it is that we do or what that anyone uh, can do it at any time. Mm. Um, for stage combat, I don't, I don't do improv stage combat. That is a recipe for injury and yeah. trauma and harm. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were, for example, invited to a troupe that does improv together a lot, I would take mm. the group through some basics mm. of stage combat and talk about how we do cues. Because you don't just, even with the actors here in, in, in Drowning in Cairo, there are techniques to let their partners know, even though the choreography is set, there are techniques to let their partners know, hey, this is coming. Because sometimes when we're doing shows, when you're doing two shows a day, seven days a week, you know, six, sorry, excuse me, six days a week, <laughs> <laughs> you know, double show days, sometimes choreography, just like everything else, you're like, wait, didn't we just do this? Oh yeah, that was the matinee. This is the evening performance. That's right. I'm getting slapped here again. Mm. So we build in cues and eye contact to make sure that we're on, we meaning the actors doing this story, doing this scene or on the same page. So I personally would never advocate for folks to just improv violence without any kind of context or training mm. or trust mm. built with each other. Um, as I say, the only way that I would maybe think about it is training specifically with a group that works with each other and knows how to cue each other, yeah. has a sense of trust, is able to build those containers. Um, very similar to what Maya was talking about is like, hey, let's talk about this before. Maybe we practice certain, how are we cueing this? Okay, great. But mm. um yeah, that's that's not how I would go about it. I yeah. even even when I work with someone else who is trained in in stage combat, say we're building a fight, and I'm working with somebody who is incredibly trained with it. We mm. work super slow and we talk it out, yeah. and we indicate, oh well, if you do this, then I want to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not improv. Here, Carla, the difference, what I'm hearing is that in the play that I was rehearsing or improvising, the priority of the director was, <clears throat> and the actors and the culture of, of the crew was, um, okay, that's a priority is to do this and to arrive to a point in the script where <clears throat> we kind of um, cre creation and all of that. And here you're talking about, no, the priority is us and showing up fully as us with our boundaries and safety measures. And then comes the rest, which I totally salute and advocate for too um, in the theater where boundaries, again, can be so mushy. 
And the no can be heard as, oh, that's the role or that's the, um, just w whatever is coming up in the improv. So thank you, Carla, for, for bringing this to our attention. Maya, I have a question for you. When I, watching, um, I was watching uh, Drowning in Cairo, there was an intimate scene behind the stage, behind, uh, I mean, backstage, um, so where we can hear the voices of, of the actors as if they're, um, they're supposed to be having sex, the roles are supposed to be having sex. And um, I want to hear more about that. How do you work uh, when the intimacy is happening backstage? Yeah, I'm laughing because this is one of the weirder parts of my job. <laughs> um, but I get really excited actually about building soundscapes. Um, uh, actors who have worked with me as an intimacy professional will know that I, um, I have a lot of strong feelings about soundscapes and intimacy because I think it can make such a big difference in believability. Um, mm -hmm. Like I, you know, I've been to plays where I go and, and, and performers are kissing on stage and it's silent. And I think it's so confusing mm. um, because then I start to think about the story of why they're so quiet, why I'm not even hearing any breath. So to me, sound or absence of sound um, is actually a really key part of intimacy um, in helping, in, in, I should say, clarify, in intimacy that is trying to be someone in the world of being realistic, right? Mm -hmm. There, I, there's abstract intimacy, sound is, is a different thing there, but an intimacy that is intending to feel like real life, mm -hmm. I think that sound is a really big part of it. Um, so in terms of the process of how that works, sound is one of the places that I find that actors tend to be the most, um, I don't know if uncomfortable is the right word, but um, maybe it is, uh, perhaps unsure. I think mm. that, and I think the reason for that is because I think the natural tendency is to feel like they have to make sounds that they themselves have made um, or would make. Mm. Um, and so for me, a lot of my work is encouraging them to think in the exact opposite direction. We're not, you're not trying to recreate how you sound in your private life. We're trying to figure out how these characters would sound. Mm. Um, and I think that yeah. that can take the weight off a lot when they're not feeling like they're having to perform this really intimate thing, um, that they're just performing somebody else. Um, right, and, and Maya, I'm just noticing the time. I can't believe it's already yes. been an okay, hour. Really I can go really fast. <laughs> yeah. I'll just say, I help them create soundscapes. So I give vocabulary and tools, different sounds, different techniques for this show and for many others that I've done, I'll record voice memos mm -hmm. um, and send them to the actors to give them a sense of arc um, and different tools that they can use. And I find that having that to work from helps actors feel infinitely less uh, uncomfortable or embarrassed mm -hmm. than they might have otherwise. Mm, thank you, Maya. Thank you so much, Maya and Carla, for all these insights and for raising awareness about the importance of safety and protection and creativity in theater. And um, we have come to the end of our time. Many thanks to you both. Many thanks to the audience members and whoever is going to join later. <clears throat> I'd like to thank, <clears throat> sorry, HowlRound for hosting this live stream event. A recording of the session will be available on both Whole Howl Round, Round, sorry, English is my second language, and Howl Round uh, and Golden Threads website. Um, many thanks to our live stream technician, Wendy Reyes, and many thanks to all of you for joining us today. And before we go, I just want to say that Drowning in Cairo is amazing, and uh, I invite everyone to go see it. I saw it twice. And um, it's gonna be in Portrero stage um, until May 1st. And there's gonna be video on demand until May 1st as well. And it's playing in DC in Gonda Theater on May 5th for those who are watching us from DC. And have a great evening or a day. <laughs> Take care, wherever you are. Thank you. Goodbye.
Thank you.